very good at what they're what they're do uh, what you uh, do. That being said, we kind of go through our career with blinders on, very focused on our functional role, rarely kind of stepping back. That's what we try and do is help employees step back, understand their company strategy, under, understand the key metrics they're driving towards, and then be able to make good decisions around that money making process. So with that in mind, let's see who's uh, uh, I got the poll is done. Let's see how many people have uh, participated. Should be able to see that. It looks like a number of you, the majority of you have participated, small percent have it, but that's okay. Uh, no no worries. Hopefully, maybe someday we'll get a chance to work with your organization. The second quick uh, question that I have is, I'd love to know how many of you, is this your first time attending one of our webinars? Or no, Brent, I'm a seasoned uh, veteran here. I've been here a number of times. Uh, again, using that polling tool, just make sure we're comfortable. How many of you are returning versus how many of you, this is your first time? Looks like we got a good group on the on the call and many are continuing to join as we continue to uh, get going this morning so make sure by the way when you're uh, doing the polling that you hit submit that will make sure that i get your results going once going twice i'm going to go and close it a few a seconds early just because uh, we got a lot to cover as we look at this uh, uh uh, this webinar. We hold these once a month. Every month we do a different industry. That's a great chance to practice using the tool that we're going to give you, the Earnings Call Lab Workbook. This tool will help you give you a simple framework, as well as two tools that will help you assess both the strategic focus of your company, as well as the financial uh, uh, performance. In addition, if you are in a sales role, this is a great resource to assess your customers, understanding that your customer, what their challenges are, and then be able to help them make a business case, how your product or service can drive to their success is a great way to use an earnings call. Here's the results. It looks like uh, a number of you have uh, participated before and uh, about 50-50. It looks like the split there as we look at the uh, participation. Well, good. Well, that's the tool. Want to make sure you're comfortable with that. We'll be using that a couple more times today. The second tool or the key tool we'll probably be using is make sure you open that chat box. If you haven't opened it yet, go ahead and open that up. Make sure you have that open and available. Make sure when it says send to that it says to everyone. That's why everybody will be able to hear your questions or your feedback, etc. So here's my question as we get going to Today, where are you calling in from? It could be a city, could be a state, could be a country, could be a province if you're up uh, north there. Uh, uh, it could be a place in your home, as many of us are working from home. Uh, I'm actually at our corporate offices here, uh, a little town called uh, Orem, Utah, but it's just south of Salt Lake City, Utah, is where we're located. I'm going to go put that in the chat box. Let's see where we got it's all over the United States. We got any international? Yeah, it looks I got some uh, international. Uh, excellent. Good to have you here. Welcome, welcome, Frankfurt. It's got to be an evening for you, I'd imagine. Uh, excellent. Well, hey, it looks like we're pretty comfortable in using our tools. Well, that's enough with the tools. We've got a lot to cover. So I want to go ahead and jump into the slide deck and let's get going here today. Again, uh, you're participating in the, uh, what the CEO needs you to know, Ernie's Call Lab. Where this month, we're featuring AstraZeneca, pharmaceutical company playing a significant role on the uh, on the front lines uh, battling COVID-19 as you think about the challenges we're dealing with. So one more polling question as we get going. When's the last time you're coming to an earnings call uh, tool or resource, when's the last time you listened to an earnings call? I got a quick poll. When's the last time you listened to your, your company's earnings call? Could be a, uh, another company's earnings call, but when's the last time you listened to an earnings call? Let's kind of get some data here as we get going this morning. Looks like a lot of you have listened to the calls this year. I can't think of a better time to be listening as you think about the, that coming out of the pandemic and you start to see the economies recovering throughout the world. Still, there's still challenges with COVID-19 and restrictions that impact the success of business for sure. So I can't think of a better time to be listening to these calls. Uh, a great opportunity to kind of understand what's going on. How does that impact what your business is trying to do? And then most importantly, what can you do about it? Well, it looks like a number of you have had a chance to listen to calls uh, over the last little bit as we kind of share the polls here. Uh, here's what we've got. A majority of you have listened to calls in the last couple of years. A few of you, it's brand new, never have had a chance. Well, I love that. G great for joining us today. And I hope I can get you motivated and excited with the tool to be able to go do this. This truly will have an impact on your career for sure. Well, as you think about this, listening to these earnings calls, 
who listens to them? Why should we listen to them? How do we think about the purpose of these calls? When you think about it as a large organization, every year they have a responsibility to communicate to their uh, constituents, their investors, the financial performance of the company. They're required by law to submit financial performance on a quarterly basis. As they communicate this, most companies will take that opportunity to share their vision, their strategy of what, how they perform during the quarter, where do they see themselves going, and how are they going to kind of uh, execute around their strategies. Well, the challenge that companies face, a few statistics, they're a little bit sobering as I think about statistics. 95% of employees don't understand a company's uh, strategy. This comes from a Harvard Business Review uh, assessment. Now, I don't know if that's accurate within your organization, but if it, even if it's, you know, 50%, if you if you think about a company like AstraZeneca, 76,000 employees, you've got a very specific strategy you're working towards. And if truly 50%, 75%, or if this is actually accurate 95 percent of your employees don't understand your key strategies how do we make sure we're getting great execution this one also is interesting 90 percent of employees don't understand their company's important business metrics now folks you may have a, a better understanding than the average that i'm communicating today that being said the more you understand about your business the more you understand about your customer's business the better able you are to differentiate yourself within your career It'd be able to be at the, understand what your company is trying to do and then align your day in and day out decisions to execute around your strategy so you got these tough statistics, right? Well, imagine you are the CEO of AstraZeneca. Uh, uh, Pascal Soyer is his name. He's the executive director and chief financial officer. Imagine you're the CEO of AstraZeneca. You got 70, 76,000 employees globally dispersed. You got a foundation, companies that have been around since the early 1900s came together as AstraZeneca in 1999. Publicly traded, you got 171 different projects in your development pipeline, and you're having a, playing a key role fighting against this COVID-19 pandemic. And if truly your employees don't understand your business, the challenges that create. Well, that's what these earnings calls are all about, a chance for you. Now, of course, they're provided for analysts, investors, but they're all publicly available. You can access this information and truly understand both what your company's focusing on, but also your competitors, your customers, your suppliers. Understand what's going on in your industry to help make better business decisions. Well, as you think about Mr. Pascal and what he's trying to, to focus on, what do you think he wants his employees to know? <laughs> what do you think he wants his customers to know? Shareholders as well as any partners. That's what these earnings calls are about. It's a chance for them to communicate to everybody. What are their strategic focus areas? How did they perform? And how can they execute in the future? The goal there is to help analysts and investors know, hey, you want to be a part of our organization. You want to continue to be invest in our company. You want your employees to understand, here's what we're focused on, and then be able to take that, that information and with your functional brilliance, be able to make good business decisions. You want your, your uh, suppliers, your partners to understand the direction you're going so you can come together better from an execution perspective. Well, folks, that's what these uh, that's what these earnings calls are all about. And as we think about uh, participating and engaging around, here's my guarantee. As I said, we've been in business for 19 years. We train on how to listen to these earnings calls, how to use them, as well as how to implement strategy and execution within a business. Here's what I've learned, and here's my guarantee to you. If you take this tool after our call today and you engage around listening to your company or your customer's earning call, or come back in a month and join us for Kroger when we get a chance to look at Kroger grocery chain and practice using this tool. As you do this two to three times consecutive, my guarantee is it will build credibility, uh, build your credibility build your career and build your company. That's the outcome I, I'm uh, adding or suggesting for you from participating in these earnings calls. Well, that in mind, let's jump into the process. I want to make it pretty simple. I'm going to give you a three-step process. I'm going to give you a framework and I'm going to give you two tools that will help you to listen to these earnings calls and, and really gather information that helps you in your day-to-day decision-making. So let's, the three-step process, pretty simple, prepare, analyze, and apply. Let's jump into the prepare section. As we jump into the prepare section, now, by the way, don't worry, you don't have to take uh, a ton of notes. You're actually going to get a, a recording of this sent to you or have access to a recording of this. And in addition to this, at the end of this, you're going to get access to the tool. So that will all be available uh, later on in our program today. But let's jump in the preparation. The first thing, let's just qu talk quickly, what is an earnings call? Basically, earnings calls are these quarterly uh, conversations that happen, and there's 
basically two parts to them. First is where the executives have a chance to do what we call prepared remarks, where they actually get a chance to talk about how they performed in the quarter, what their strategies are, and where they go into the future. It's uh, prepared. Prepared remarks are typically somewhere between uh, on this low end, probably about 20 minutes, all the way up to maybe 40 minutes. Then it shifts and it goes to analysts have a chance to ask questions. Now, these analysts are part of these large investment firms. They get a chance, they're tracking AstraZeneca as well as many other pharmaceutical companies, and they write reports that they submit to investors, which basically directs or, or, or gives them information as to whether or not they should buy, sell, or hold on to their stock. These are anywhere from 40 minutes, 45 minutes, that's a short one, all the way up to they can be like an hour and a half, two hours, depending upon who's talking and what's going on. But these happen on a quarterly basis and everybody has access to them through the internet. As you look at the, uh, that's what they are. So let's talk about what do you do in the preparation phase? Three steps. First, you gotta locate the call or transcript. Let me give you a simple way to locate that call or transcript. We got that great website we're all familiar with called Google, uh, where we can go and search and access this information. Very simply, the easiest way to access the inf its information is type in AstraZeneca. I can't talk and type at the same time. <laughs> AstraZeneca Q1. And then if it's pre-call, you want to type in webcast. I can type. Let's see, I got AstraZeneca, all sorts of messed up here. AstraZeneca, there you go, Q1 uh, webcast. Let's see if we get there. AstraZeneca Q1 webcast. It's going to give you information. Now, you're going to notice there's stuff that's specifically from their company, but eventually you'll get into kind of third party where other companies kind of assess and provide information. You'll see like Seeking Alpha and some of those others. But I want to look for that kind of webcast one, and I just click right there. I click on that and I'm there. Now, if this was pre-call, it'd actually have a place where you just register for the call. Because if the call happened a, a, a month or so ago, it's actually going to have now the recording as well as all the information. If I want to listen to that webcast, I click right there, go ahead and continue, and that's going to actually put me right into a registration. When I hit register, it'll then give me access to the recording. They want to kind of know who's uh, uh, involved in or who's participating in these calls. If I want the press release, what they communicated from the press release, press release are great because it gives you a little overview of what happened in the quarter, but it also gives you their financial statements. So it's a great way to access their financial performance. Uh, some companies have presentations, and I love the presentations. If you can get access to presentation, I would access it. The reason I like it, it gives you a lot of data and kind of summarized points. It's a real kind of uh, uh, directed approach to what they want you to focus on from the call itself. So you'll see here, here's their agenda. They do a little overview. They talk about different segments of their business, their financial performance, and as well as kind of where they're headed in the future, et cetera. Great resources, great opportunity. They have a little overview of their clinical trials. Pharmaceuticals, it's all about where, what phase are your drugs in, in their clinical trials. Uh, as they continue to progress, what are those that potentially are going to come out, hit the market, and begin to generate greater revenue and cash flow for the company? AstraZeneca also has a little video vignettes that they put together where their CEO and their CFO kind of communicate to the market what's going on. Again, you can access the webcast as well. The last thing that I like to access is a transcript. If you... Uh, if they don't have a transcript on the on their website, then I just type in AstraZeneca transcript, uh, Q1 transcript. So I look there, you'll know there's a number of different AstraZeneca, uh, Seeking Alpha has it there. I click on that and I can actually access the transcript right here if I want to get access to the transcript. Here it is drafted for you, the writings. It's basically transcribed. Whatever was communicated in the call is all available to you. Now, if it's pre-call, all you do is sign up for a register for the, for the earnings call. They'll send you an invite. They'll send you a, a, a calendar opportunity where you can put on your calendar, and then you just join it the day up. After the call, within usually 24 hours, all that information is available as far as uh, the, the press release, the, tra the transcript, uh, a slide deck, et cetera, that they might have available. 
So that's the first step. You got to access it. Once you've accessed it, the next step is to review your notes from past calls. Now you may say, Brent, this is the first time I've ever listened to them. Well, that's okay. You may not have that. Now you could do that same search and look at say Q4 of last year and you can get a, hear what happened in Q4 if you want to create your own notes. But if you participate in these two or three times and complete the earnings call workbook, that then becomes the resource that you come back to every quarter. So as you complete Q1 of, of AstraZeneca, then in Q2, you just review your notes and come back to it. And then the last thing I recommend from a preparation phase is this, to basically meet with a team, to bring your team together. If you're a supervisor, bring your team together and go through this exercise. It's a great way for your team to really listen to what your executives are talking about and determine what are the actionable things you want to do after. If you don't have a team, maybe you're an individual contributor, just get with a colleague and go through it. It's a great way and I always encourage to do it with others. It really helps to enhance the learning experience. That being said, if for some reason you can't connect with somebody, no worries. You can do it on your own as well. Well, folks, that's the preparation. Pretty simple. Access it, review any notes from prior quarters, and then get with the team to prepare for the call itself. The core of the work that you're going to do in these earnings call is in the analyze phase, the next phase. Now, before I jump into it, I want to do a quick review of a simple framework that we use in our program. It's called the five driver business model. This is really at the heart of how to think about or, uh, uh, or capture information from these earnings call. It's a simple framework that these are what I would suggest are the five fundamental drivers every company focuses on. Whether it's AstraZeneca generating uh, $7.3 billion in revenue in Q1 last, uh, this year, or a small mom and pop shop. These are the fundamental drivers every company focuses on. So I know 50, more than 50% of you on the call today have been through our programs. So here's what I want you to do. In the chat box, let's kind of walk through these together so we all get a simple uh, idea of how to use this framework and then i'll show you the tools around it so let's start with cash in business uh when, when executives are talking about cash it's vitally important in fact a common phrase is cash is blank fill in the blank for me cash is excellent there cash is king could be queen cash is vitally important however you want to say it. in fact ron sharon says this Cash is a company's oxygen supply. If a company runs out of cash, they die in business. So cash is vitally important. Yet what's interesting in day-to-day -day business, you often don't hear as much about cash. It tends to be, come up when the cash is a challenge. For example, during the, uh, this last year of COVID-19, the airline industry's got hit very hard. For those of you that joined us last year, we talked about Boeing. Boeing had to access $35 billion of debt to kind of withstand the downturn, because obviously demand for airline uh, uh, transportation had dropped. They had 450 uh, 737 MAX sitting, they couldn't deliver yet. It was a real tough time for them. So they had a real issue around accessing cash. Versus if you look at like, uh, say, Amazon, which we also did uh, in prior quarters, as we looked at Amazon, they were generating cash so quickly, they didn't have to carry as much cash. As COVID-19 drew people to on-demand shopping in a, an online uh, 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 format. So cash is vitally important as a company. So as you listen to these calls, be thinking, what are they talking about cash? Where are they getting access to cash? How are they deploying, et cetera? Now, of course, the foundation of that driver is going to be uh, the cash flow statement. For those of you who've been through our class, this is where you get to see how a company manages its cash. Of course, then profitability, there's two levers we talked about in our program on how companies can access profit. A pro, how you can grow your profitability. Now, again, you don't uh, have to go through our class to understand these two levers. Many of you already know what they are. If you want to grow profit in your company, what are the two levers you have to impact that? If you remember for the class, we talked about increasing one thing or decreasing another or some combination of that. How do we impact profitability? Excellent, looks like a lot of you are getting those uh, increasing revenue or sales, and we can do that by better pricing or selling more. Well, the second is to reduce cost. Now, by far, the, me the lever that gets pushed more often than companies is the cost reduction because that is seen as somewhat uh, controllable, that we can control our cost structure. That being said, you've got to grow revenue through selling more or greater pricing by having more unique products and manage your expenses. That's the key strategy to grow that. Of course, the foundation of that driver is going to be that income statement where we get revenue minus expenses equals profitability. Profits also known as income or earnings, as you might rem remember. So profit by far is the one that gets discussed quite a bit. And as you listen to AstraZeneca, there was a lot discussed around profitability. Of course, assets is anything your owner control, which has value value in a business as you think about astrazeneca what do you think their assets might be if you were to pull up their balance sheet what types of assets would you expect to see 
Anything you own or control, which has value is the definition. Yeah, drugs or, you know, so you might have some inventory or what they call stocking, right? As they distribute it to pharmacies, they call it stocking. Uh, that's going to be part of that. Of course, patents is going to be huge for them. Those patents is where they make all their money. Those kind of key drugs that are patentable, they're able to generate a lot of uh, cash flow and profitability on those drugs. And then the moment it goes generic, you'll see that uh, revenue generation drop dramatically. Of course, uh, uh, staplers, love that, Jerry. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, labs they're going to have, they're going to have equipment, they're going to have cash, all these things are what you're going to see. And of course, the foundation of where you can see their assets is on the balance sheet. Balance sheet is assets uh, equals uh, liabilities plus equity. So you get both the assets they have, what liabilities do they have against those assets, and then what equity do those investors have? Now, of course, investors love to see profitability increase. They love to see cash increase. They also love to see assets increase. One of the big focus areas of a pharmaceutical company is going to be uh, their late stage uh, um medications where are they at in the process because those become their future revenue generations opportunities for them of course growth is gets a lot of time and attention as a publicly traded company because that's what the market is driven on now as you look at growth what metrics you're talking about it's everything we've already we discussed cash profit and assets where are we growing our assets what cash generation are we ge uh, developing how much profitability are we, are we expanding from our company etc of course, the core of this, and this is purposeful, by the way, if you've been through our program, we would suggest that people are at the center of a business model, which may be counterintuitive sometimes when we think business. Business is all about cash generation, profitability, et cetera, but the core of it is people. You think about it. If the customers that you provide your products or services are core to your business. Of course, then your employees executing around your strategy is core to your business. So this simple framework is a way that you can, a uh, framework you can use as you listen to these calls, a way that you can capture what are they really talking Talking about. They talk about cash, they talk about assets, uh, profitability, growth, or people. As you start to make decisions, how does your decisions impact cash? How does it impact profitability, assets, growth, or people? And then how does it align with your cor corporate strategy? That's how you can use this five driver model. So with that in mind, let me introduce you to the first tool. It's called the executive alignment tool. It comes part of this earnings call uh, a lab packet. And it's a simple way of using the five drivers to assess the strategic focus of your company. Here's how it works. As you listen to the call, every time they say something about cash, you'll put a little slash mark. Every time they say something about ass, uh, profit, you put a little slash mark, assets, growth, and people, et cetera. Now, don't worry if you haven't gone through our cash or uh, from our if you have not gone through our class, don't worry. We give you a basic definition of each of these drivers. We give you a little overview of how to think about the driver. Not only that, the genius of the tool is it gives you some what I call trigger words. If you hear them talk about dividends or distribution, that's going to be a use of cash for sure. Stock buybacks, buying back stock, that takes cash to do that. Of course, getting access to debt, that's a cash generation. Issuing stock, etc. So we give you simple trigger words to be listened to. If you hear those words, just go ahead and put a little slash mark. Once you've gone through that process, you then uh, answer four simple questions. The first question is, which business drivers seem to get the most attention? And I love the second part of that question. Don't leave it out. And why? What's going on in the context, context of the business? What's driving the focus around those areas? What's going from a strategic perspective? What about the new products they have? How is that driving each one of those drivers? Then what are the two or three key messages or uh, points the executive's trying to make? What are the goals and trends or objectives going forward? And then finally, because you're listening to an earnings call, what are the questions the analysts are asking? Where are they kind of pushing back, et cetera? That's the tool. It's called the executive alignment tool. And as you do this, you quickly kind of get a, a, an assessment of their strategic focus of their business. So what I want to do is we don't have time to go through the whole call. We've only got about 35 minutes left, but what I want to do is I'm going to go, we're going to practice using this and then I'll show you I've completed the document. What I found from listening to AstraZeneca's call. So let's start with the first thing you do. You listen to the call and you get a communication. The, the executives are communicating to the market. Here's what I want to do. Get your chat box open and let's go through this first one. Their CEO is going through a uh, communication to the market. And let's see which of the five drivers seem to stand out. So here's the first sentence there. The 11% the increase in revenue was boosted by sales of COVID-19 vaccine for pandemic use. In the chat box, which of the five drivers, you see him right on the screen, is he focused on? Okay, got a lot of profitability for sure. When you're talking revenue, revenue and sales are definitely levers of profitability, but also the growth. It's an increase, right? We're seeing 11% increase 
uh, in their total revenue or total sales in Q1. Great measures. Everybody loves that. Market loves to see that. Let's go to sentence number two. The revenue use for guidance excluding the COVID-19 vaccines for pandemic use was up 7%. So we got 11% total revenue growth. But if you take out the COVID-19 sales, it's only 7% growth. Now, that's still good growth for them. Uh, as you look at that 7%, last year they had some stocking benefits, meaning, meaning, basically meaning pharmacies bought more uh, product to stock up their inventories. And last year was a low, uh, low mid single digit percentage, which actually they considered a pretty good growth for Q1 of last year. So basically what they're saying is, is that 7% is really quite strong in comparison to last year, even though it's a low mid, mid single digit last year, last year they had some benefits because of buying extra inventory. So which driver seems to be focused in that sentence? What stands out to you? Some of the similar stuff we already talked about, right? You're going to see growth for sure. Assets, you talk about the vaccine for COVID-19 definitely is an asset for them. Yeah, you got growth again. Uh, it's a lot about growth uh, as what as, as far as what's going on in the business. So the last part, if you uh, if you remember, it was a strong growth uh, that he's talking about Q1 of last year. And therefore, we estimate that the longer life revenue growth being double digit, low double digits in the first quarter and uh as part of our full year guidance. So what are they forecasting? They're forecasting that they're going to get growth of revenue in that kind of low to mid single digit, uh, double digit revenue uh, year over year, which is great. And as you look at that again, we're back to growth. We're back to profitability, et cetera, as you look at their business. Well, folks, that's how this works. Pretty simple. You just read it. And what are they talking about? Now, one of the kind of uh, um, caveats I want to give on this is that it's not exact science, meaning if you and I were to read the same paragraph, we may not have the exactly the same number of slash marks around each of the five drivers. That being said, we do about a thousand sessions a year. And invariably, when we do this program and go through this activity, the top two or three will race to the top. Everybody in the group will get the top two or three pretty consecutively. So it's a simple way to kind of assess what they're focused on. Let's do another two. Let's look at this one. This is their CEO uh, talking about uh, their business in one. So I'll let you read that and just put in the chat box. What are they? What which drivers seem are they focusing on in this communication? Yeah, a lot of you are saying cash, uh, dividends. That's one of our trigger words. Dividends payments of $2.5 billion. That's cash going out to their investors. Of course, we're seeing every time you see a term like cash flow or cash on hand, that's going to be cash. A lot of cash for sure. Here we got some cash again. We're getting a little profitability, but cash is definitely a core of his communication. Here. You get a little profitability down here. Uh, it talks about deleveraging. If you know what deleveraging, that's strengthening your balance sheet. So you're starting to go into a little bit of assets if you want to throw a little assets in there. But definitely a lot on cash as you look at what's communicated there. Now, again, we talked about they shift eventually in these earnings calls, and then uh, analysts get a chance to ask questions. Uh, Simon Baker from uh, Redburn asked this question. Kind of review it and tell me which of the five drivers is he focused on? So a lot of you are saying growth, definitely growth for sure. But I love, let's see, who said that? I got bumped up. Jenny, uh, this is also about people. It's their customers. This is one of the things that surprised me as I went through and I, uh, I went through this call is think about how COVID-19 has impacted how many individuals are going able to get to doctors to get diagnosed for challenges. Because of COVID-19, it slowed down. They actually have less people be, being diagnosed uh, around cancer or other, uh, you know, uh, physical ailments because of COVID-19. Guys, this is pretty serious. Like, I was surprised about that. And so he's talking about as we're starting to come out, you're starting to see more diagnostics happening. Now, of course, that impacts the success of their profitability, but the core is we got people out there who may be sick, but are unable to get in because of COVID-19. You think of the heart of COVID-19 when everything shut down, how hard it might be to get access to the medical uh, field to help you out during this pandemic. 
uh, where there's restrictions as to what you can, uh, how you can get access to to those resources, etc. So yes, definitely growth for sure. But the people idea, yeah, absolutely, Jerry. Uh, so less cancer diagnosis due to people not going to the doctor. Absolutely, it's not only people not going to the doctor, but not available. Doctors not being available. You think about a doctor having to make sure that they get vaccinated. So all the challenges. Um, the whole industry shifted to battle COVID-19, which meant it's harder for people to access those services. Absolutely. Uh, very interesting. Well, folks, obviously, we don't have time to go through the whole thing, but I did it for you. So here it is. Now, again, if you were to do the same activity on AstraZeneca Q1, our numbers may not be exactly the same, but the, the top two or three I, I would guarantee are going to be the same. Of course, we've got a lot of attention on assets, meaning all the different drugs and where they're at in their process, et cetera, as well as growth opportunities. Those by far were the two top. Now, of course, profitability got a lot of time and attention or some time and attention and people as well. But notice how much cash. Now, remember, we said cash is king. You might be saying, Brent, why are they not talking about? It's because it's not an issue. They have plenty of cash on hand and their access to cash is very available. So a lot of focus around new drugs coming out, what's available and how that impact their growth. So that's what it'll look like. Now, one of the things that you'll notice is I do them in two different colors. The reason I do that is I like to tell what is the, uh, the kind of prepared remarks or the company messaging versus where are analysts kind of pushing buttons. And you'll see some similarities. For example, assets and assets, very similar, very high. Growth and growth, very high. But then you'll see some uh, kind of differences where uh, the corporation spoke a lot more about profitability than the analyst kind of discussion and questions, et cetera. Now, it just gives me more data. I would then want to look more detailed and see what are the analysts, maybe look at what their uh, their reporting is, is saying to see how they might see things a little different. Once you've done this analysis, now we jump into answering questions. There's four questions and I've answered them here. So let's jump into each one so you can kind of, we'll get a chance to kind of review. So first, what was, which of the five drivers got the most attention? Of course, it was assets and growth. What was it from the asset? It's all their uh, medications. From an oncology perspective, you see growth on many of their key oncology uh, uh, new medications. Uh, Tagrissa, for example, 13% up. Infin-Z is up 17%. These are lung cancer uh, uh, resources. Of course, Limparza uh, up 33%. So it just talks about where the growth is, what assets are generating greater growth. If you look at their other segments of their business, uh, cardiovascular, cardiovascular, renal, and me metabolism kind of medications. Again, a lot of growth in different assets that have come to market. So they discuss what's going on from those asset perspective. Now, what's nice is they actually have a, um, a slide deck, which I love because it gives you a nice summary of what's going on around these key medications. We already talked about Tagriso and what's going on there. They saw huge growth. Now, as it goes into different regions, it opens up. As they pass certain levels of uh, efficacy as well as safety use, you'll start to see it grow throughout uh, their pipeline. So uh, what I love is they give you a nice overview of what's happening with some of those key drugs that they talked about. So in addition to the key drugs on the asset side, what about growth? What did they speak? Obviously the growth in these medications and expansion in different geographies, uh, diff different opportunities, et cetera. But they also talked a lot about growth of their key metrics. One of their key metrics is they wanna grow their revenue. That's one of their kind of five key areas of growth. And 11% increase of revenue, we already talked about that, boosted by COVID-19, about 4% of that growth came from COVID-19. That was a big focus. 68 million, the battle against COVID was big. 68 million vaccine doses shipped in Q1. These are shipped and sold, but throughout their network, they actually produced 300 million uh, uh, doses. Of course, new medicines adding 800 million to new cells. Uh, it was a big part. And then, of course, the key growth areas. Again, because of the slide deck, it gives you a nice little breakdown. What areas are growing? Oncology and their CVRM uh, grouping had some great growth versus respiratory immunology and other medications. You see a little dip. Uh, What's also nice is it shows you by area. Geography is a big focus. Where are they expanding? Of course, key ones that they're looking at is emerging markets. And then, of course, China are key growth opportunities. So a lot of conversations around that. So why would they be focusing on that? Well, that's key to their business, right? Analysts and investors want to know what are the new products coming out, new medications coming, where are they in the stages, and what sort of growth potential does that create? For them, that's key. That speaks to their potential growth in their revenue and opportunities as a company. 
Uh, so big focus there. Of course, COVID's big focus because they're key, a key player within that uh, battle that's going on. So what were the two or three main points that the executive were trying to make? What's nice about this is uh, often they'll do a little summary data for you, which is great to use. Here's some of the key data points that I found as I went through it. Uh, solid start to the year. Great success within their core business. Again, we kind of highlight 68 million doses, growth in revenue, et cetera. They're very confident in Q1. You know, think about this. Often businesses, they'll do their Q1, and then they'll kind of say, well, we're not quite there. They're, they wait a little bit later into the um, uh, year, but give that strict confidence that they're going to hit their numbers. Well, they're already feeling as of Q1, strong pipeline progress supports their double digit revenue growth. That's the guidance they give. Low teens is the number. 22 phase three medications and significant life cycle projects coming out. Faster growth in their core earnings per share is kind of, the, they upped that a little bit based upon what they saw in Q1. Of course, global presence drives growth. So their emerging markets, China is a big focus. That's where they see a lot of opportunities to get their products into the market, et cetera. As you look at this, here's a nice summary document that they gave in their slide deck as far as that solid uh, start to the year. So if I was AstraZeneca, this is a great review of how they perform, total revenue, their growth, how their core operating profit performed, what's going on from a pipeline perspective, the environmental, social, government, you know, that COVID-19 vaccination, how that's playing a big role there. Of course, they've got an acquisition, Alexion, another opportunity to add about 11 new products to their portfolio, which they're excited about. Of course, growth in their uh, earnings per share that we already talked about. So where do they see themselves going in the future? Kind of three areas that I saw. Continue response to COVID-19. That's key. They continue to play a significant role in that. And they have a nice slide that kind of reviews what they're focused on. They're in 80 different countries as far as opportunities, and they're continuing to expand that to make that available to continue this fight against COVID-19. Of course, strong pipeline. We already talked about. That's a huge focus of the coming uh, quarters in 2021. And then uh, they kind of give a nice overview of what's next, what's beyond that. What do they see happening different, uh, both in the oncology and biopharmaceutical, uh, different drugs that are potentially going to make it to market, finishing phase two or phase one, and where they're progressing. So kind of showing their pipeline was a key focus. And the last thing was this whole idea of financial priorities, kind of five specific areas. Number one, they want to grow their revenue. That's that 11%. They're forecasting the low teens growth in their revenue. Operating leverage, that's basically growing their revenue faster than their expenses, creating what they call operating leverage. Of course, growth in cash flow was a big focus. Deleveraging, basically paying down their debt, strengthening their balance sheet, and dividend growth. Uh, that's the five financial priorities that they have for the company. So if you're working for them, the question is, how do I drive those? How do I drive revenue growth? How can I manage my expenses to allow my revenue to grow faster than my expenses, which is going to create greater operational leverage? How can I impact uh, cash flow, et cetera? And of course, then they'll use the extra cash to pay dividends and deleverage the company. Again, a nice slide available. Uh, uh, the reason I'm bringing these up is just to show you, if they have a slide deck, it's a nice way to get a quick summary of what's going on in the business. So finally, what were the key questions or concerns raised by the analyst community? You can kind of guess based upon what we talked before. A lot about pipeline. What's going on around updates, efficacy of, of, of future products uh, or future medications, trial phases, and what, where they are throughout the progress. Uh, Go-to-market strategies, growth in geography, especially in China. That was a big part. Uh, what they call the national reimbursement drug list. Some of their drugs hit China's national uh, reimbursement drug list, which allows them to now buy them and bring their products in uh, as they start stocking up to use those products or service. And then, of course, the COVID-19's uh, impact on the rates of diagnosis. That's a big one. What's happening as far as diagnosis in U.S. versus outside of U.S.? Uh, and I got honestly, folks, that that was a... Uh, aha for me. And I thought, man, uh, another challenge of this COVID-19 impact. And yet they're right at the forefront trying to help uh, to kind of overcome those challenges. Folks, that's how you do it. You read through it and you just kind of capture which of the five drivers they focus on. What are the two or three key messages they're talking about? Uh, what are their strategies going forward? And then finally, what are the analysts trying to ask questions about? Where are they kind of pushing back? That begins to give me a nice kind of message about their strategy and where they're focused as a business. So once you're done with that, now let's say, what, where do we go next? The next is the navigating the financial tool. Now that I've understood the strategic focus, I want to see how they performed around their financial metrics uh, and uh, uh, metrics and measure. Now, Jerry's asked a question. I apologize, Jerry. I may have missed that er uh, earlier. But do most companies have slide decks? You know, honestly, it's about 50-50. I get some that... Uh, 
have it all the time. And, and these pharmaceutical companies, we did Pfizer about eight, nine months ago. They absolutely had a nice slide deck that they put together. It kind of depends upon the industry as to whether or not they use a slide deck. Uh, when I say industry, it's probably not even industry. It depends upon the, the indiv individuals preparing the, the information. But I would say probably 50, 60% will have a slide deck and then a smaller percent don't have a slide deck. Let me know if that answers your question, Jerry. Great question. Well, this financial tool, for those of you who've been through our program, you'll be familiar with this tool. It's a simple tool that brings kind of uh, three things together. You're going to get the five driver metrics and measures on the side. You have the key financial metrics. Now, what I've got here are the key financial metrics most companies look at. If you've taken one of our programs, you'll remember we use your specific metrics. For example, if you don't use return on assets, maybe you use return on capital employed. Obviously, we weave that in as a resource. That being said, this tool can be used with any company, and these right here are the 10 most common metrics every company looks at or can look at. Not only that, it gives you what the key metrics are, but then what line items do you look at in the financial statements? If you want to assess the financial performance, you want to know what, what kind of line items should I be looking at? Now, the genius of this tool, by the way, I can't, I, I'm not bragging. I didn't create it. Somebody else did from our team. But the genius of this tool is it tells you where to go to find these statements. For those of you who've been through our course, you may remember we walked you through how to uh, look at the financial statements, what key line items, how they should be tracking, et cetera. But if you haven't, that's okay. This can give you where do I go to find this information. Now, if there's any sort of calculation, you're going to have it right in here. So, for example, on net profit margin, you actually have a calculation you have to do. Versus cash and cash equivalent, you just plug the numbers in. Not only that, you can look at their current performance, but then you can do a comparison. You can look at quarter over quarter, year over year. You can look at uh, uh, competition. You can look at customers. You can look at any company if you want to compare. But that's the tool. It's called the Navigating the Financial Tool. You don't have to go through our program to understand how to use it. Now, once you get it and you're kind of like, what is uh, equity ratio? That Google search is a great resource or jump online and, and, and uh, um, you'll come to our website. We'll help you kind of figure out, you know, how to think about those metrics and measures. But that is how you use the tool. So here's what I want to do. We're going to go ahead and use this together. Now, I know we don't have time to go through the whole thing, but I want to get make sure you're comfortable in kind of how to do this. So here's what I want you to do. Get your chat box available. And what I want to do is I'm going to go through and ask you questions and you help me fill it out. So the first one we want to look at, we want to get that cash and cash equivalent number. That's the first one I want to look at. So in order to get that, what statement do we have to go to to find cash and cash equivalent? Put in my chat box, if you would. There, there you go. Balance sheet is most common. Now, one of you said a cash statement. Actually, Will, you're correct. You can find it on the cash flow, but the most common place to go to find it is going to be that balance sheet. So I go to my balance sheet. Now, again, you don't have it, but I've got it there for you. So go ahead and look on the screen. We're looking for cash and cash equivalent. Now, for those of you that were in our cl class and you were using a U.S.-based company, it was created based upon what they call GAAP, Generally Accepted Accounting Principles, which if you remember from the course, on a GAAP balance sheet, it's listed by most liquid down to least liquid. Well, this is an IFRS uh, financial statements, International Financial Reporting Standards. That's everything outside the United States. They just flip it. So current assets are actually at the bottom versus your fixed or long-term assets at the top. So just a little bit flip, flip. But let's get it. We want to get the cash and cash equivalent. How much cash and cash equivalent did AstraZeneca have as of March 31st, 2021, at the end of the quarter? Put it in my chat box. Let's help me fill that out. Yeah, $7,636, right? <laughs> Manish got it there. It's got that million. Yeah, it's seven billion six hundred and. $36 million of cash on hand. So we go back, we plug it in, it's right there. We got our cash. Okay, now we want to get a cash flow. How much cash flow do they generate? Now this one up here, whether it goes up or down, it's kind of based upon strategy. As an investor, I don't want that cash just to be sitting in a short-term account, that cash to cash equivalent account. I want to see you use it to invest. But I also recognize, I don't want you to go deplete that to where you have no cash, and then you can't withstand kind of ups and downs of the economic environment. Versus cash flow, on the other hand, we want to see that go up every single year. So let's see what happened to AstraZeneca in Q1 of this year. So again, what statement am I going to go to? Tom, I'll get to your question here in just a moment. Uh, there you go, statement of cash flow, absolutely. So I jump over to my statement of cash flow, and I'm looking for cash flow, net cash flow from operating activities. How much cash flow did AstraZeneca generate in Q1 of this year? Put in the chat box. There you go. 
It's right there. 1934 Look at how big of a swing that was from year over year comparison. Now, if we had more time, I could jump in and explain a little more detail what's going on. But that's a huge swing. Nice performance in Q1. They generate $1,934,000,000 in Q1. So you just put that right in there. You've got that number. Now, the question that was asked earlier was around, do private companies provide similar earnings information? Tom, I wish I could say that they all do. They don't. A lot of them don't. Now, depending upon um, what type of industry, some industries, they actually will. So, for example, if I'm a co-op, meaning uh, my employees own the company, I submit financial information. Some insurance companies will submit financial information. So the key thing to search for, if it's privately held, is to look at uh, an annual report. Search for an annual report or search their company name and financial metrics. If for some reason they're not sharing them, another way to get familiar around key metrics and measures, we do this a lot of times with sales groups, is to go ahead and look at a company in their industry doing something similar, one of their competitors that is public, and you'll quickly see some of the key metrics and measures. Then when you have your conversation with your prospect or whoever you're selling into, you can ask them, these are kind of the key metrics I see in this industry. Are those the key metrics you're focused on? And then you know, be able to speak to, you know, the challenges within the industry and they may open up and share, et cetera. But not all privately companies, they, they're not required to. So if they're doing it, it's because of some other reason. Maybe their debt structure they're required to submit, they're part of a co-op or uh, they're part of certain industries where they want to communicate some of that financial information. Good question, Tom. Okay, so we got that. We've got the, uh, the cash metrics. Of course, we want this one to go up. This one goes up or down kind of based upon strategy. Let's go to the next one. We've got total revenue. Total revenue, where are we going to find that? What statement am I going to? There you go. We want to go to the P&L. Thank you. Jerry's put in P&L. Another name for the income statement is a P&L. Great kind of refresher there. So I want to get, I'm going to get two all items. I want to get my total revenue. I want to get my net income. Both of them are on the income statement. So let's go to total revenue. Got my total revenue. What's that number? Put in the chat box. Make sure we're clear there. Generate seven billion three hundred and twenty million. Of course, I often, if you've been in our class, the first thing I always look is that growing or not. Yep, it absolutely is growing. I love to see that. It only grows because of new products or new uh, selling more, or selling things at a higher price. And you'll see both of those had an impact on AstraZeneca year over year comparison. So then I go, thank you for all the zeros, Brooklyn Parks. Excellent there. That's an accurate number. Seven billion three hundred twenty million and a lot of zeros. So then we go to our net income, going to the same statement, get our net income. Now, interesting, because it's an international company, they're not using the same term. You don't see a net income. So help me out. We got to find it's not net income. Those of you who've been, with our, been through our class, you'll remember there's two other names for income. One is earnings. The other is profit. So we're looking for net income, net profit or net earnings. There you go. Profit for the period. That's their example. That's their net income number right there. That's their net income. 1,562. You see a huge swing. Now, one of the big impacts that they had year over year uh, uh, was they actually divested an asset. 26% ownership is called a veal. Uh, they divested that and they got that payout. About $700 million or so was part of that in 2021. So that's why those numbers are up a little bit. And by the way, how do you know? How do I know that? Because I can read. It's in their earnings call. <laughs> they talked about it. So here's their numbers year over year. We got those. Now now that I've got my total revenue, I've got my net income, all I have to do is do my calculation. Here's my net income. Here's my revenue. Do the calculation, 23.3%. That says for every $100 AstraZeneca brought into their business in revenue or sales in 2021, Q1, they generate $21.30. Now, ideally, we want to see that improve year over year. You're improving the margin. When they talk operational leverage, if I get greater operational leverage, I should start to see my margins increase. Folks, that's the tool. As you think about this, if you were to do this for the next two or three quarters for your company, for your customer's company, how would this change your behavior? How would this impact your decision making? How would it impact as you create that trusted partnership with your, your customer? That's what this is all about. Now, here's the numbers. I'll give them to you. There they are. If you want to take a screenshot, they're available. Of course, you got Q1 numbers versus Q1 of 2020. So you can compare it year over year, Q1 to Q1. You could do it sequentially, which is Q1 to Q4 of last year. 
You can also do it uh, based upon looking at competition. Here's Pfizer's Q1 numbers versus AstraZeneca Q1 numbers. You can see some similarities. You see, uh, uh, you know, growth in their top line, a little bit more growth at, at, at Pfizer, but then you look at growth at the bottom line changes. So you can see what's going on from a comp competitive landscape. And if uh, for all the all of you that were with us last month, we did General Motors. You can compare it to any company. This is who we did last month. Uh, uh, which was General Motors. Of course, you see very different metrics and measures or, or, or financial performance based upon the industry they're in. So folks, that is the tools. Once you've got that, you now have the strategic focus. You know how they're performing on their financial performance. Now it's all about apply. Now folks, uh, application is key. If you come to this and you say, hey Brent, that was a great uh, uh, training. That was a great overview. And you don't do anything with it, I've wasted your time. The whole idea of any training is to change behavior, to help us get better at what we're trying to do. Application is core here at Acumen Learning. That's a big focus to us. What's the outcome of the learning? In fact, as we work with our clients, we have many opportunities to get a great focus on assessing the quality of the outcomes that we try and provide. For example, we had one of our customers actually do an assessment on what sort of benefits, what's the impact of listening to earnings call. What the benefit of applying business acumen principles? As I said, we work with 30 of the Fortune 50 providing training on business and financial acumen across the board. Here's some of the outcomes that we get from people participating. As you listen to these earnings call, 84% improve the performance of their business and function. Increasing, remember I said, I guarantee you'll impact your credibility, your career, and your company. 81% increase in collaboration, better able to get execution internally. 77% improved upward communication. Oops, let me go back there. 77% uh, improve employee engagement. I'll tell you, I can't think of a better way to increase engagement for employees. Once you understand what your company's doing and why they're doing it, it helps you to feel that connection on what you can do to apply. 75% increased business focus and 84% improved teamwork. Now folks, we'd love to work with any of you that are not part of our, 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 our Acumen Learning uh, graduates. This is a great way to build your credibility. And the one thing that I recommend is start with this tool. Start using this with your team as a great resource. So application is key. As we think about application, to know and not to do is not to know. Do something with it. So the last part of the tool is the application portion, where you're gonna go through what key insights did you gain, based upon what you've learned, what are you gonna do? And then it all boils down to a, a conversation. What are you gonna do with this? So let me walk through just quickly my wrap up on those. First, huge uh, um, eye opener for me, the impacts of COVID-19. I was unaware, I, I was very aware of their role in fighting the disease, but I was unaware of how it was impacting the health of individuals beyond COVID, that people are not getting diagnosed. So folks, hey, let's get in, let's get our, our annual checkups, let's get tested and let's make sure we prevent some of these life-threatening uh, uh, diseases out there. Of course, the strength of their pipeline was huge. That was a key insight for me. Advancing early and mid-state pipeline, and then this acquisition with Alexion were huge insights for me as I thought about their business and then understand the industry. So what am I gonna do with it? What is my thing? Based on what, I'm gonna compare their performance with their peers. Obviously, uh, 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 I talked about Pfizer, for example. I wanna go see how they compete within their industries and their specific uh, markets. I share this information in my findings. Our company is all about sharing this information with my internal consultants, our clients, as well as new customers. What's going on in the industry and how can they influence them? Now, of course, I love to work with AstraZeneca. So determine how Acumen's or Acumen Learning can help AstraZeneca employees understand their business and help them make good decisions by understanding what their executives are talking about. Again, what I find is the more you understand about the big picture, you already know your function. The more you understand about what the company's trying to do, the better able you're to to execute around your strategy. And then finally, once you've got that, it's to have a conversation. So for me, I'm gonna sit down with our sales team and talk about here's some resources and how we can be a great partner, how our products and service can help drive what AstraZeneca is trying to do. That's the second one. If it's a customer, what do I wanna try and do? If you've analyzed your own company though, what should you do? Sit down with your manager, share the three things you wanna accomplish, get that support. If you analyze the competitor or benchmark company, again, sit down with your manager or your team, talk about how can we differentiate ourselves? How can we continue to have a unique product that allows us to get great margins in our company? company. But that's the goal. Once you've done this analysis, have a conversation with somebody around how you're going to apply it and, and, and execute around it. Folks, that's the tool. Prepare, analyze, and apply. 
So remember, I said in the prepare phase, there was a second step. That second step was this. It was to uh, review your notes. Well, that tool, if you go through that tool, everything I just captured is in that tool. And that now becomes, as I look at AstraZeneca in Q2, my way of kind of assessing what's going on in their business. How did they perform last quarter? That is the tool. Well, folks, here's my question to you. My question is this. Have I motivated you enough? Are you interested enough? And if so, who are you going to listen to? That's my question. Uh, let's see. Who are you going to listen to? Here's the poll. Are you going to listen to a company you work for? Are you going to listen to a company that you want to sell to? Are you listening to uh, a partner? Maybe you want to visit a, a company you want to invest in or you're interested in. Now, next month's webinar is Kroger. So you might be saying, hey, I'm going to use this and come back. I, that's a great way. I'd highly recommend it, particularly for your graduates. Come to multiple ones of these and, and practice using the tool. It really gives you a chance to kind of say, now I get it. Kroger may not be your company, but practice using the tool will help you get greater uh, confidence and using the tool within your company or whatever organization. So as you think about who you want to analyze, uh, it looks like we've got a lot of you saying a uh, company you work for. About 42% are saying that. I'm going to go ahead and close it just in the interest of time. Go ahead and wrap that up. So about, uh, let's see, about a lot of you, the majority of you are doing a company you're going to work for. Uh, then the next is a company you want to invest in. A lot of you said that. A company we sell to, as well as a company we're interested in. Got a little time. And a few of you talked about Kroger. Excellent. Love to see you next uh, next month. And we'll kind of look at that. Here's the results there. Took a second for those to get calculated. Well, hey, so where do we go from here? As we wrap up today, my goal is to provide those resources. So let's get to that. As you go to this, this acumenlearning.com uh, webinar, here's the link. I'm going to put in the chat box. Go ahead and go there right now. What does it provide for you? First of all, if you want to recommend a company, we can look in the future. We're doing Kroger next, but it's a place where you can say, here's who I think you should look at in the future. We take that information and add it to kind of our planning. The second thing it's going to do, if you want additional information, like I said, our goal is to help build the business acumen of every employee in every organization. So if you're not currently working with us and you want to, there's a place to sign up and we'll follow up with you. In addition, once you've done that, you'll get access to the workbook. Everything I've talked about is all in there. In addition to that, you can sign up for the next call. Kroger's call is on July 22nd. And the last thing is Ginger talked about. If you want a refresher, maybe it's been a while since you've gone through that. We have a course, an online course, got a lot of recognition as a simple way to refresh your mind around the five drivers and the three financial statements. If you uh, 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 graduate, you want a quick refresher, we'll give you $100 off on that if you go to that link. In addition to that, if you've never been and you want more information, again, it's a great starting course, a great place to start. It'll give you a nice foundation on the five drivers as well as how to look at the three financial statements. And then as you come back to these webinars, you'll get more and more comfortable with it. Well, folks, it's truly been a pleasure. Grateful to have some time with you as we wrap up today. Me and my team will stay on if you have any additional questions. Otherwise, thank you very much for your time and have a great day. Looks like we request... Uh, are people using the tool on paper and digital format? Uh, so I, I believe we have both. We got a read writable PDF option uh, where you can do it electronically, which is great. And then some of us are a little old school. Actually, I, I'm kind of in, I'm an in-betweener. I take it, put on my iPad, iPad, and I use a pen to mark it up. Uh, so you can do that as well. But we got a read writable version as well as you can print it off and use it that way. Great question. Looks like we put the link in to uh, how to access the book. I think some questions around how to access the book. It looks like a link in there. Hey, Jeff, great to have you on. Thank you much. Let's see, folks, was there any questions we missed as we went through this that we need to go back to? I apologize. With the number of people, sometimes it goes too quick and I miss them. Well, folks, again, thank you for your time uh, going to get access to the resources and the follow-up. Again, I just put that in the chat box. Just click on that link, acumenlearning.com forward slash webinar. And that's going to help you to make a recommendation as to who we should look at in the future sessions of this. Also, if you want additional information, it's there. Uh, we'll, we'll follow up with you. 
Uh, great question, Susan. Can we do a private company in the future? Uh, I think it's something that we should bring to the committee and look at. Uh, the challenge will be, of course, on the financials, but we can look at some companies that do have financials that are privately held, how you do it. That would be a great one. I'll put, let's put that on the list. Make sure you go to acumenlearning.com forward slash webinar, and it says, who should you look at next? Just go ahead and put a private company. That will be a great way. If we get enough people wanting that, we'll for sure do that. That will be a great opportunity. Again, once you go to that link, you can tell us who we should look at, get additional information, get access to the workbook, uh, register for our next uh, Kroger call happening on July 22nd, uh, and or uh, access to our $100 off on our online training. Thank you, Sergio, good to have you. Appreciate you coming again. Patrush, thank you very much. Good to have you as well. well folks, we've dropped dramatically in our numbers. There are a number of you still on though. Uh, thank you as well, good to have you. What's the difference between your training on your website and those offered on other platforms other platforms. Um, so the training on the website, if I'm getting the right one, it's our online training. It's a self-paced learning experience that has 13 different modules, uh, testing, there's some social learning opportunities where you can ask questions and get some responses from uh, other people in the class, but also uh, from it's moderated by facilitators. Uh, but it's a, it's, it's a, the course as is, is generic form. Some of our clients have us customize that. And so it's uh, we'll do the same course, but it has kind of their numbers and metrics and measures in versus what you're seeing in kind of a, a platform. I think that's Microsoft M O O C S. Somebody help me on that. Uh, other platforms, as far as like our virtual platforms and how we'd look at that. Uh, it, it, Typically, it's the customization. We're going in to customize. So, for example, tomorrow I'm doing it with a client where I, I look at their financial metrics and measures. I look at their strategy. So you're learning business financial acumen through the lens of your business. <coughs> so that's that's the uh, benefit. And obviously, there's activities, there's group learning that comes uh, from kind of a virtual or face-to-face -face experience that were added. Let me know if that answered your question, Susan. <coughs> Oh yeah, open course. Uh, yeah, Casera, those types of things. So we uh, we do some of those kind of keynote type of experiences as well. But as far as those open source Casera, you're going to have a lot more detail around. Uh, it's 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 a practical application. How do you think about this through the lens of your business? That customized approach, and that's what we find. I, honestly, when we first started our company, uh, we did it on generic metrics and measures, similar to what you'd find on some of those open source opportunities. The challenge is you're forcing that learner to take their knowledge. Uh, learn business and financial acumen generically and then try and apply it in your organization. I think that one unique things about acumen learning is we're customized. So when they're learning business financial acumen, they're learning it through the lens of your business. What exactly what your executives are talking about? What are the key metrics they can drive, et cetera? And that's where we really found. So we shifted gears, uh, I don't know, 17 years ago and said, no, we got to make this customized because that's where we really see the movement happen. Once an employee understands what's going on in their business, the why behind what's going on, they understand your key metrics and how they can impact then they're already functionally brilliant. They know their functions very well. They're then being able to make better business decisions for your company. Let me know if that answers your question. I thank you for that clarity. Massive online open uh, courses. Yes, thank you, Jerry. Adding some additional. Uh, for potential investment perspectives, what are the things that are easy to gather uh, from earnings calls that can be looked out for? Um, you know, uh, obviously, as you look at what we've provided here, that's a great. There's two types of kind of investment strategies. One's called a technical uh, uh, investment strategy. The other is called fundamentals. Technical strategy is my understanding. It's, it's what you see in all the kind of third party uh, assessments where you've got stuff like volumes, you've got beta, you've got PE ratios, all those things. You can track all that information you can do the calculations off these financial statements. But there's a lot of third party websites that can give you that data. If you're not familiar with it, a lot of time you can scroll over and it'll explain what those are. 
fundamental trading is more what kind of Warren Buffett talks about, where he understands the economic model of the business and be able to make good decisions. I'll give you a quick example. One of my clients is an oil is, is a mining company, uh, a copper mine. Uh, last year, uh, early stage of last year, as COVID hit, their stock price was down to like three dollars and fifty cents, very low. And all the all the metrics, uh, kind of the technical trading metrics, was suggesting you know it's a it's a sell option. Well, if you understand the fundamentals of their business, they have a, a large copper mine in Indonesia. They're going underground, so their production is going to jump. It was just a transition, COVID hits, et cetera. If you look at their stock price uh, lately, it's like $30, $40. In fact, some of you may be on. But that stock, being able to understand the economics of their business, that it's a copper mine. Copper's not going away. As long as they don't run out of cash during this downturn, they'll be okay. And of course, you know, 18 months later, it's it's a 10 times return if you invested at $3.50. So uh, let me know if that answers your questions. Uh, uh, the technical side, understanding P ratios, volumes, et cetera. Uh, and then of course, understand the fundamentals of the business. Uh, during the uh, dot com, Warren Buffett stayed away from those because you can see how they can make money. That's what you'd call more of a, a fundamental uh, strategy of investment. Let me know if that answers your question, uh, Jacob. Good question. Oh, thank you, Jerry. Jerry. Jerry says, and a lot of the others are heavy financial jargon boring. I think that is another thing, and I'll add on to what Jerry said, the difference between us and others. We've learned how to teach. One of the biggest challenges in teaching this topic, and it's really any topic, but definitely finance and accounting, is what I call the paradox of expertise. We forget what it was like the very first time we learned it. So we're throwing out free cash flow, uh, return on invested capital, as if everybody knows what those are. Well, we understand how to present it in a way that helps people. Uh, a very common phrase I get is, why don't they just say that? <laughs> why don't they just say it that way uh, versus the, the terminology that they use? And once people can see that and understand what it is, all of a sudden they're able to execute around it. And we've learned how to approach it that way. So thank you, Jerry, for that. Well, folks, we're about six minutes after the hour. I still have a few of you on. Happy to answer any additional question. My team is still here. Otherwise, we're going to start wrapping this up and let you go for the rest of your day. Thank you for your time. Invite others. Anybody's welcome. It's open enrollment, whoever wants to attend. And again, if you have any interest around this to learn more about what we do, please uh, go to Acumen Learning. I'll put it in one more last time, uh, forward slash webinar. And there's a click on the box that says you want additional information. One of our excellent sales directors will reach out and share uh, what we do and see if there's uh, uh, an opportunity for you. Okay, folks, we're down to just uh, about where AstraZeneca said their revenue would hit this year, low teens. <laughs> we're going to go ahead and start uh, closing this down. Again, if you have any additional uh, questions, go ahead and jump on and let us know. Otherwise, we're going to shut this down. Okay, Ginger, let's go ahead and close the recording and uh, we'll go ahead and shut it down. Thanks, folks. Have a great day.